Hello and welcome everybody. My name is Annalie Maley and this is Under the Surface. Uh, today we have a super, super, super cool guest. We have Lexi Rogers here with us and she's going to talk us through everything about her story and her life. Thank you for joining us, Lexi. Thank you so much for having me. It's so exciting. I mean, we've been talking about this for a while, just getting you on and getting people to get to know who you are as a person, as a human. You're pretty cool. You go, right? <laughs> I do my best. Yeah. I do my best. It's a work in progress, but. Yeah. Um, so people have been talking about you a little bit lately. Let's start, Lex. Who are you? Tell, give me a quick blurb. Who is Lexi Rogers? I am Lexi Rogers. <laughs> I'm not non-existent. Um, I grew up in Melbourne, love Melbourne, uh, outside of sport, love being creative, love, ex- love adventuring, love exploring, also love doing nothing at all and just chilling and staying in bed all day. I love that for you. Are you on any Netflix shows at the moment? <laughs> I'm not sure if we are at the moment. Oh. We, we were watching something. Actually, yeah. you know what we were watching that was really We've been watching Dance Academy. Oh my god! <laughs> yes, like it's a bit embarrassing to admit, but no, not embarrassing at all. Yeah. That is cinematic genius. Yeah, a group of twenty-three-year-olds. <laughs> that is share house actually Dance cinematic genius. Yeah. I have, I reckon, rewatched like all the seasons of Dance Academy because I'm in love with JoJo Siwa, um, so many times. <laughs> like, because yeah. it's just it gets more dramatic every time we watch it's it. It's full on. It's full on, but it's, it's good. It's really great. When you say that you're creative, what are some of the things that you do that um, help fuel that side of yourself? Uh, thank, like my group of friends, they're all super creative. Mm-hmm. It's a mixed bag. So if we're at someone else's house or if we're at a house, there's someone drawing, there's someone painting, there's someone mm-hmm. writing. I, I did a lot of music when I was a teenager and a lot of music when I left high school. Um, that's something I love doing and love collaborating with friends with. But I also love writing as well. So I do a lot of writing, nothing anywhere to see. So don't <laughs> yes, go looking for writing stuff. Watch this space, yeah. Maybe. <laughs> um, but, yeah, we're always doing something and there's always someone doing something interesting. So even just sitting back and watching what other people do is always great. That's really cool. Were you like that even as a kid? Like that that was something that you did or was that something that you kind of grew into later in I, life? I was I – was, Forced into playing an instrument. Yeah. All of my siblings were forced into playing an instrument. Um, so I sort of was doing that when I was younger and I loved doing that. Um, but kind of didn't as well because we were forced into doing it. So yeah. loved it, hated it, left it and then came back to it and now yeah. I really love it and I'm glad I have the skill. Yeah, yeah, that's fair. I wish my parents forced me into playing an instrument because I am hopeless. Like <laughs> like my, my younger brother can play the guitar and just like pick up and just – kind of like he hears a song and he's like, oh, yeah, chords, you know, yeah. and he can just yeah. do anything and he'll pass me the guitar and I'll be like, ding, like and that's, <laughs> that's the end of my expertise yeah. in that area. Um, just kind of as I guess as we talk about you as a kid, who were you as a kid? What were you like and how would people describe you? Uh, it's interesting. I'm the youngest of three, mm-hmm. so I've got an older brother and an older sister and then it's me. Um, I always – was quite a shy and quiet kid, I always thought. Um, kept to myself a bit, but was always super active, like always in the backyard running around, playing with brother, playing with sister. Yep. So that was great. Um, but, yeah, shy kid, didn't do a whole lot of talking. If I got comfortable with people, then I was a distraction in class. <laughs> was the general consensus. I think every report I ever had from from school from start to finish was... They're distracting They distract people. Yeah. Literally same. Yeah. <laughs> Literally same. I feel like those are the best type of people because we make everybody else have fun. Yeah, exactly. You got to have fun while you're doing it. Exactly, exactly. So what was your schooling experience like? Where did you Where did you grow up to start off with and where, where did you go to school? Uh, I grew up in a place called Montrose. Um, if you're from Melbourne, you probably know where it is, but it's like a little town at the bottom of Mount Dandenong, kind of just before the Yarra uh, Ranges. Very beautiful place to grow up. Lovely. Mm-hmm. Love the mountain. Love the Yarra Valley. Um, I went to school locally, so just primary school up the road um, and had a pretty pretty normal primary school, yeah. normal experience. Um, and then went to high school at a place called Billinock College mm-hmm. in Moral Bark. Oh, my God. 
I know Villanook. We used to play volleyball against Villanook. Well, <laughs> save that for later because there's oh. a lot of volleyball in this story. Oh, my God. Great. I'm so excited. Yeah. Okay, continue. Um, so <laughs> went to Villanook College, which was, again, a great school, great environment, a great mm-hmm. culture. Um, got along pretty easily with people, played a lot of sport and endless sport. So that was always a, a fixture. Mm-hmm. Um and yeah, it was pretty pretty standard stuff, like pretty pretty regular stuff. If when it wasn't behind the scenes, yeah, yeah. Would you say that you had a pretty good support system around you in high school and stuff like that? Or because I also I am of the idea that no one enjoys high school, but that's just my complete bias. I know many people that are like, oh yeah, I loved it, but I'm like, no, you didn't. You're lying. Like, what was? Did you enjoy high school? Was that like something that was fun for you? Uh, I didn't like. I didn't enjoy going to high school, <laughs> and I didn't enjoy doing what high school is supposed to be. Yeah, but I loved going and distracting others and yeah, mucking yeah. around with friends. Like, <laughs> yeah. that's, that's what I went there for. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I did quite enjoy it, especially by the end when when we'd all been together for so long. And with sport too, that was a big thing. Like yeah. lunchtimes, after school, before school, there was always typically volleyball. Yeah. Um, so I always looked forward to that as well. The community of sport is pretty cool, hey? How did you get into... I guess. Did you play basketball first or were you yeah. volleyball first? Yeah, I played basketball first. How did you get into basketball? I was little, little. So I would have been like grade one or two or oh something. Oh, my God. Tiny baby. Yeah, my mum would have been coaching primary school teams mm-hmm. and would have. I think she was coaching my brothers. Yeah. And they just needed bodies. Yeah. So I, I played in my brother's like grade three team. Yeah. For a season and cried every game. <laughs> it was pretty pathetic little kid. And then just kept doing that kept doing like little baby basketball primary school and stuff and then started domestic my dad loved basketball as well so we had a hoop out back yeah kind of was just always going to be basketball that's what my brother and sister did as well so did domestic and then end of primary start of high school did club yeah yeah tried out for club and then I was once you're in that, I was in that, and that's just yeah. what you do. That's yeah, just what right? you do for the next however many years you do. It's kind of like so streamlined. It's like once you play Brett basketball, you're in. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> your Fridays it's... are taken, your Saturdays done, Sunday, Sunday mornings, training. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What club did you play for? Coincidentally, uh, Kilsive. Ah, okay. Yeah. Right, well, I mean, I guess it's kind of close to where you Yeah, are. exactly. Yeah, yeah. Um, but that was pure coincidence that yeah. I ended up back there. Um, and then domestic, I played Saints, if anyone knows what's, what that is. Shout out Saints. Uh, <laughs> there's so yeah. many clubs that could be called Yeah, that. yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's fair. And then so you said that there was a story behind volleyball. Do you want to go into it? There isn't, there isn't. Yeah. So I started high school and Bill and Ook's a big volleyball yeah. program. They have this one guy there who just built the volleyball up to what it what it was or is and it was yeah. massive. Um, so my sister went to Bill and Ook and – immediately fell in love with volleyball and immediately got into Vic teams and Oz teams and all that sort of thing. So I saw that when I was younger and was always kind of like, oh, well, if I go to Billinook, like, that's what I want to do. Like, that's yeah. cool. Like, I really looked up to that. It looked like a really awesome, fun opportunity. And so I got to high school and just went and tried out and because I was my sister's brother. Yeah. Was just, like, put in the team. Yeah. And then... I did basketball and volleyball for a long time, just both of them, and was just training one day for one, one day on the other, one day for one, one day the other. Literally vibes, I did the exact same thing. Yeah, (laughs) and then it got to a bit of a head uh, when I would have been maybe 16, 17, where both were getting full on. Yeah. There was like the Vic stuff going on with with basketball um, or the Vic camps, Mm -hmm. and then there was – Still the Vic stuff I'd been doing for a while with volleyball, but the opportunity to do some Oz stuff as well. Yeah. So I kind of just took the opportunity to do the volleyball stuff. Yeah. And that's when I stepped away from basketball because volleyball, could, I could travel around the country. Or I could do, go, I went overseas with it a couple of times. Yeah. Like that opportunity was in my head. I was like, that's going to be awesome. Like yeah. that, that'll be unforgettable. Whereas basketball, I'll probably just hate doing a bunch of camps yeah. and more training and more this and and I, I was a lot more integrated with volleyball community than than basketball mm-hmm. I was still really shy at basketball and didn't talk much and wasn't very loud yep. but volleyball I was people knew who I was yeah and I was fun and I was better at volleyball as yeah. well so yeah I made that choice and then stepped away from basketball and 
so I guess my the next question is is like your your life, right? The, the story of you. When did you start figuring out who you were? And like, I, this is a very bold question because on the last podcast, I had to answer who I was, and I was like, I have no idea. Like, yeah. But what was the process for you starting to figure out that? you weren't who you were supposed to be and you're trying to figure out who you are. Like it's, how did that all, t- t- tell me everything. It's, it's a, a lo- it took a long time and mm-hmm. it was uh, quite a long process. And I look back in it in hindsight, at the time I didn't think much of it, mm-hmm. but in hindsight, I feel really sorry for that young boy, mm-hmm. dash girl. Um, so when I was around 10, 11, and moving out of primary school into high school, start of puberty kind of age, Yeah, I would get these feelings and these tendencies of, you know, oh, I wish I was a girl, oh, I wish I could do that, or yeah. that sort of dysphoria with who I was and who I wished I could be. Yeah. And it was ultimately, I wish I, wish I could be a girl. Mm-hmm. And I would have, there were a, few, a couple of times where I might have like a dream one night where I was a girl in a dream yeah. and was like, wow, that was that was great. That was awesome. And then wake up and be like, oh. Yeah. (laughs) And then that sort of escalated for a couple of years to the point where um, my parents might take my brother and sister out to the sports stuff and be out for like a couple of hours. And I would sort of sneak into my sister's room or something. This is really embarrassing. And try on some of her clothes or whatever, stuff like that. Um, but I still felt really ashamed of that. Like I would do that. And then afterwards just feel really ashamed of myself. Like, oh, what is wrong with you? Like, that's weird. Yeah. And then I, when I was about 14, I think I almost got caught doing that when someone forgot something and came back home. Yeah. So I didn't get caught. So this was all super, super secret. Like I would never let anyone in on these. You never told anyone about it. No way. So that was all happening in your own head without any sort of support. Well, it escalated to that point. And in my head, there were some nights where I would be up in my bed and I'd be like, I could tomorrow, if I still feel like this about it, I might tell my mum or I might tell my brother or my sister or whatever. Mm -hmm. And I would always wake up the next morning and just be back with like, no, nah, it's yeah. too scary. It's too much. So that sort of got to a bit of a boiling point. Mm-hmm. And then I kind of, and this is the sad thing when I look back is like, I remember just getting one day to making a decision that was just like, okay, I can either tell someone and go down that route and see where it takes me. And I felt mm-hmm. like I would sacrifice all of my friends, all of the sport, everything I had to do that. Or I can come to terms with not engaging with that side of myself and not making that my identity and just living my life as a boy and living my life as a man and just being content with that. Yeah. And I made that decision and I did, I came to terms with it, <laughs> came to terms yeah. with it, didn't really. Um, and then I sort of from there just suppressed all of those feelings and emotions and all those things I was doing. Like I was kind of like, okay, that's enough. Like that's wrong. I'm not going to do that. Mm -hmm. But there was a serious sense of shame the whole time when I was feeling that way. And then that just got worse as I'm after I made that decision. Yeah. Yeah. Almost as you had to suppress it, it started boiling up more. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, I was pretty good at suppressing it. Like, and what, what happened was I, I chose to suppress it and I moved away from it. And at that point, sports was getting a bit more full on. Like you get more opportunities to do high level sport, different things with sport. And so I kind of just jumped headfirst into that. Mm -hmm. And that was just who I was. So, okay, I can't be the pretty girl. I want to be whatever, whatever. I'll be the sporty boy who's really good at sport and everyone likes because they're a jock and they're cool and they're this and that and this and that. So I... I ended up doing it. That's why I dove so heavily into sport as well. Um, Cause there's just, there's just a status quo with it. Like you can mm. just see how many people fit in with it and have an identity out of it and that's who they are. So yes. I sort of just sort of latched myself onto that Yeah, and was pretty committed to doing that for the rest of high school. Yeah. yeah. Do you feel like in those sporting environments, and this could be completely wrong, but in those sporting environments, whether it be poly- volleyball or basketball, were you ever able to explore 
like even the thought of being something other than this like masculine jock you know what I mean like do you think that there's safe spaces for people to be able to be like oh can I explore who I am here or did you have a different type of experience Uh, it was interesting difference between both sports because basketball I was in when I was really young and Mm -hmm. so I probably had an idea of what the basketball community was in my head yeah and I was still super shy up until the till the end of when I was playing it so in basketball it was probably it was probably my own kind of insecurities but I really didn't express myself and feel comfortable doing that in the basketball space volleyball was totally different because basketball when you're at that age you're pitted against each other it feels like like you're always competing always on and off the court um volleyball was a bit more cooperative like you need people in volleyball like everyone's touching it in volleyball and you need a good set or you need a good hit or you need whatever um so the community of volleyball and probably because I came to it when I was a bit older I just immediately loved and was embraced by and and was much more comfortable expressing myself in and then through volleyball like when I felt more and more comfortable in that space would be more eccentric or more flamboyant with how I played or how Mm -hmm. I dressed or how I did whatever. Like I always loved standing out. I always loved standing out. I would like draw on my tape if I drew, if I was taping my knee and stuff or I would wear a silly headband and have hair going everywhere and things like that. Yeah. Because I loved standing out. I loved being different and I felt comfortable doing that in volleyball. Did you have anyone in high school while you were kind of, a, having this inner battle of like, who am I? But also like then trying to enjoy your life, I guess, that you were able to confide in that kind of knew what was going on. And if so, who was the first person that you were able to speak openly to about not feeling right in your body? Um, at that time, at that time, I, I'm still best friends with the friends I have from high school. Yeah. Um, but at that time, I didn't tell anyone still all throughout the entire of high school. No one ever knew. Um, so it was only a, like, even after high school, it was only f- a few years later mm-hmm. when I finally kind of let someone know about the thoughts I'd been having in that space um, and the floodgates opened a bit. But yeah. I feel it's it's in hindsight, I could have told them. I could yeah. have told them when I was – like year seven or year eight or yeah. something they wouldn't have cared it just would have been what it was it's like the perception it's like we always think that other people will react completely differently hey yeah it's like yeah um and we were talking about this the other day it's like we're both very highly anxious people right so yeah. the the thought process of like telling someone something and then being like oh my god but then they're gonna never talk to me again it's yeah. like yeah. like we almost need to trust that you know, the people around us are in our lives for a reason. Hey, yeah, it's kind of, it's kind of hectic. There. Especially in high school when there's such a kind of, yeah, like there's a huge fear of judgment. Everyone has a fear of judgment, but for there's sure. also a pretty big, at least at my school, big divide with the boys and the girls. Yeah. And when you're a part of like the boys group or yeah. a group of the boys, mm-hmm. it's, you feel like you're going to, if, if I did tell anyone like, I'm going to be outcast. Like, I'm going to be so alone yeah. if I do that. Were you a part of that, quote, unquote, the boys in high school? No, definitely <laughs> not. We were, d- no. I wasn't stereotypical <laughs> jock, Yeah. you know, meathead, let's go bash each other up on the oval or whatever. Yes. Like, like, we were pretty weird still. Like, we were yeah. definitely kind Quirky. of in the middle. Yeah. 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 So, I guess, like, the next question is, is, like, how – and when did you make the decision to transition? And what was that? What was that? God, there's so much that goes into it. But talk us, talk to us about your journey in that space. And you know, you said you suppressed it and you kind of accepted this life. At what point? And then from that point, were you like, all right, well, I'm going to live as truly who I am? That it's so I went through high school and mm-hmm. it's super suppressed, super suppressed, like. Mm-hmm there's a 10 locks on that door and that's not getting out yeah. ever. And that yeah. became normal. Like yeah. that just became part of my life. Yeah. So I got pretty comfortable with that. Um, un- really unhealthy, but became quite comfortable with that. Yeah. And then after high school sort of felt I could either pursue volleyball mm-hmm. or uh, go to uni. And 
at the time, the advice I was getting from everyone was to go to uni. So I left home. My sister had left home mm -hmm. when she was younger. So again, I saw that and was like, oh, I want to leave. Yeah. That's so, cool. yeah. so I left so home. Cool. I left home like almost straight after year 12 um, to go and study in Bendigo mm -hmm. and lived there. Represent. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then lived there for the next three or four, five years. Yeah. Um, and it was really hard leaving sport. I sort of, my passion for volleyball had kind of waned. And yeah. when I made the decision to study over volleyball, I was kind of like, okay, well, I'm going to take, I'm going to take a step back from yeah. volleyball. Like um, that's just how I felt. So I did that. And then it was really uni living on uni residence for a bit and then living in share houses and partying a lot and being gross and <laughs> carrying on all the time, like not doing any work, just mucking around all the time. It was great. Yeah. Shout out Starva. You ever go there? <laughs> <laughs> Mention my name at Starva. Yeah. They closed down. They closed. Oh, I know. It's so sad. Anyway, sorry. I digress. Really I digress. I remember yeah. when Universal closed down. And yeah. So sad. Shed it up. Now it's the deck, isn't it? It is. Yeah, it it, is. it's a vibe. The deck is still a vibe. Shout yeah. out the deck also. Yeah. Um, <laughs> anyway, so yes, Bendigo, you were out, you were partying, you were enjoying your life. Yeah, yeah. Like that sort of superficial, I love life. I'm going to go and be a crazy yep. dickhead, basically. Yeah. Yep. Um, and then I kind of leaned into, because I moved away from sports, like it was probably more leaning into being, you know, that more one of the boys like yeah. larrikin and especially in the country that culture is oh, a lot yeah. more oh yeah th prevalent yeah. so sort of lent into a little bit more of that and a little more like you know boy pack mentality kind yeah. of thing and that i think under the surface was <laughs> under yeah. the surface, <laughs> um that kind of was fighting a lot with the suppressed stuff that that you know i could identify with sport quite easily so it's easy to make that my identity, mm -hmm. but I couldn't really identify that closely with being one of the boys. Yeah. And so slowly but surely over, over the course of a couple of years, those thoughts that I'd had almost a decade before and those tendencies, they'd come back in full force and they were vicious. Yeah. And I was really at war with myself for a while. And then lockdown happened and I was in a relationship at the time and I did the whole year lockdown, was working, was whatever. But, yeah, it was bubbling away and it was sort of starting to escalate and escalate and escalate. And then at the end of the year, um, broke up with my girlfriend and that was really, really hard, again, because I was having all these sorts of like, a similar thing where it's like if I don't have a partner, no one's going to love me, especially yeah. if I feel this way. Like, like I've got so many things going on in my head that are just conflicting. Like it felt like that was, I was just going to be alone. Yeah. So we broke up and that was really rough. And then literally like two or three weeks later, my mum was diagnosed with uh, terminal cancer. And so at that point, mentally, I just bottomed out, yeah. like rock bottom, was living on my own in a flat that I was living with my ex-girlfriend in, yeah. just on my own, locked down, mum's, not looking good that mm. was brutal like she was always my go-to yeah so that was such a blow and then um at the time I was in uh, Melbourne yeah just for the year and I was going to move back to Bendigo for work mm -hmm. and to finish my uni and I did that and just felt like yeah rock bottom couldn't get worse really really awful and I feel bad now looking back being like oh things were so bad that in my head I was like if I express myself differently or if I feel like this or if I engage with those feelings I've suppressed for so long, how could it get any worse? Yeah. Which is sad. And it that's is. not how it should be for people who have those feelings. Yeah. But that's how it was. Mm -hmm. And so that was the first time I told a friend about how I'd felt and all these different things I'd felt and how I wanted to explore my feminine side mm -hmm. within being a male yep. and then did that and immediately floodgates opened. Yeah. It was just obvious and it was just explained so much and it was like the euphoria I got mm -hmm. from wearing 
tighter clothes or wearing dresses or doing what I used to do when I was 13, 14, but doing it with the support of a friend and doing it in my own time as well. It was overwhelming. And that's, it was just so quickly, just like this. Like you could breathe, like you've been walking around with someone pressing on your chest and now you can. (sighs) Yeah, Yeah. It was a weight off. It was a huge weight off. Um, And it was such a quick, quick move from, oh, I'm going to be a more feminine guy to, oh, I'm trans. Yeah. There's no doubt about it. Yeah. Um, And then connected with a couple of people who had had the same experiences and saw all, looked at resources online and all these different things. It's just like, yeah, this just makes sense now. This all just makes sense now. How did you find that support system? Like those people that you connected with that, um, we're able to steer you in the right direction because I can only imagine that, like, you, you know, we're not educated about resources or anything like that in yeah. school and in any sort of our education processes. So how are you able to reach out and find the right people or did they find you? Well, I think that was all of the, like, lack of information and lack of resources and, and all of that. I think that's part of the reason you do feel like you're supposed to be ashamed of it and suppress it. Mm-hmm. That's for a different time. Um, yeah. I met this friend just after high school mm-hmm. on um, Tinder. <laughs> and I like go- how you muttered the Tinder <laughs> word. You're like, I met this friend on yeah. Tinder. Yeah. Um, but we just we were just friends. Yeah. Um, and we hit it off. Like we were really close, got along, best mates. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I knew that they had been with a transgender person yeah. before. And so – I kind of always felt like if I was going to tell anyone, they would be who I told. Yeah. But because we just got we got super close over the course of the next three, four years anyway, that they were just the person I would tell and yeah. they would be the right person to help me get through it. And they were. And, and they connected you with the people that you needed to talk to? Um, we discussed it. Um, we, did, we just talked about it at length. So the first the first stage was kind of just like, Airing everything out. Here's and ten years of suppression. Yeah, <laughs> Catch yeah. this. Oh, yeah. yeah, it was a lot, and it took weeks to sort of wrap my head around the whole what it, what everything was and what it was going to look like. And then they encouraged me to call a gender health clinic in Ballarat, mm-hmm. which I did, and um, they p- were just sent through all kinds of resources, all kinds of different doctors, all kinds of different everything and Mm -hmm. it was from there that that everything just kept flowing through but from the decision when I told them and started engaging with all that girly stuff that I wanted to and then realized that I was trans I kind of just started telling everyone yeah yeah which was scary but also really exciting because I was like hey guess what yeah (laughs) yeah yeah hey Here's some information I need yeah, to tell you'll, you. Yeah, you'll never guess. Yeah. <laughs> Did you have anyone in your life that was like, yeah, no shit, you know? <laughs> uh, very few. Really? Very okay, few. yep. Family, I think, was all very, very surprised. Yep. Very surprised. Um, and then I had I think a couple friends who weren't that surprised, mm-hmm. but I think the general response was, what? Like, yeah. What do you mean? Because you do, you just, I just hid it away and yeah. kept it so private for mm-hmm. so long. Like just, this was just for me to know. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, everyone was very shocked but became obvious really quickly. Yeah. Everyone. Like everyone kind of clocked back at little anecdotes and was like, oh, is that why you said yeah. that that time or is that why you did that that time? It's like, yeah. 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 <laughs> Uh, put A and B together. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so when you spoke to your family, I know that for a lot of people, like being open with their family is like a really difficult thing. Like, I mean, on a different level, I remember coming out to my family and I got the whole like, yeah, of course, like no shit we've known for longer than you have. Yeah. Um, but what, how did your family respond when you told them that you were trans and w- what advice would you probably give to people who are needing to talk to their family about that type of stuff it's uh my family didn't have any so my brother's gay Mm -hmm. so 
he'd come out years and years and years he ago. He paved the way for you. <laughs> well, it's it's funny and I've just oh, – like he did because I didn't feel – once I knew, mm-hmm. I didn't feel worried about telling anyone yeah. really. But um, before I knew, I was kind of like in my head, oh, there's already – already one of us is already there can't be another you know yeah (laughs) that's just so irrational and so crazy yeah um but a genuine thought that I had when I was a teenager like it's kind of funny (laughs) how ridiculous um but yeah I felt I knew he wouldn't care yeah um and I went to my mum first because I used to call my mum every day like Mm -hmm. She was my go-to. So I called her and her initial response was not really what I was expecting, which was just sort of shock Mm -hmm. but fear. Yeah. And she was scared and she was worried and she cried because I think she was just scared of how much more difficult my life was going to be. And she she didn't know anything about what the trans experience was, so she just jumped to the worst conclusions about what it looked like being a trans woman in society. And then... You know, over the course of a couple of weeks, that kind of tempered out a little bit, like that mm-hmm. chilled out and she was just fully on board and fully supportive because, you know, what are you going to do? Tell me no. You know, <laughs> do it. Um, yeah. But, yeah, she was fully supportive. She was fully on board. And I was nervous about telling my dad because, because like, we used to play sport all the time out the back and all mm-hmm. these different things. So he was almost the last person to know in the fam. But he was the most accepting and the most amazing about it. And I told him... I told him I was like, oh, I'm actually trans. And he was just like, oh, cool, okay. And I then he that. went away, read a bunch of books himself, like did all sorts of research himself yes. and was just like educated himself about it. And it was just he surpassed all expectation. I love that so much because yeah. isn't it scary to think that like, I mean, I know for me, like my I was scared to tell my dad like Mm. that I was dating a woman and I think that there's this misconception sometimes and also sometimes it's been confirmed but that like the straight male of the family is going to react in such a harsh way but like to educate yourself and then to support your child like that's a beautiful thing yeah he was incredible he was incredible like and that ongoing support, has he been someone in your corner now that you can rely on with stuff or? Uh, yes, he <laughs> is. I call him all the time. Mm-hmm. Um, in the last couple of weeks, which has been quite full on, yeah. um, he's on his honeymoon. So uh, I haven't been able to talk right, to him. Right, yes. Uh, you told me he was in Africa, which is, is. super random. So, yeah, he's kind of hard to get a hold of at the moment. Yeah. But he is definitely in my corner He's yeah. once he's back. So if I'm, I'm going to ask about kind of the next stages of your journey, quote unquote, and like I find journey is an interesting term that I use because we're, we never really find our destination, right? Life is just a journey. Wow, that's really quotable of me actually. Life is a journey. You don't have a destination, whatever. Like we never stop learning. We never stop growing. We never stop changing. We're, we're always evolving. So you in Bendigo or in Melbourne when you first started your transition and you've told people and um you're now when was the first time that you really stepped out as Lexi like I am Lexi I am a transgender woman Uh, and this is me it was so I moved when I I moved back to Bendigo for Mm -hmm. the year and um was telling friends and family and was telling a lot of people but it was still especially I think because I was in Bendigo too I was a little bit like well it wasn't public yeah it wasn't public and uh, once I started the medical side of things, um, mm-hmm. which was just the natural progression, and that was a really s- pretty breezy process for me because yep. of where it sat with me. Yeah. Um, I still kept it pretty quiet for the second half of that year because mm-hmm. um, I still had a job. I still had a job where I was a bit scared of what that might look like or like what the hell am I going to wear to work? Yeah. Like what am I going to ask people to call me or what pronouns and all these different things and I knew that I was going to come back to Melbourne after the year was done yeah so I didn't shy like I still wore the clothes I wanted to wear and you know did my nails and did my makeup and stuff like that but I didn't really have like a stepping out thing in Bendigo where I was like hey yeah it's me I'm different yeah but once I moved back to back to Melbourne at the end of that year I was like yeah this is I am now a woman I live as a woman I love it like comfortable with where I'm at 
everything was just fully done. Yeah. How do you deal with people um, misgendering you and dead naming you and you doing that type of thing? Because I, I've always I have a close friend of mine that's trans and um, he. Uh, it's it's harder for him to deal with it because he just gets angry, um, rightfully so. How do you deal with that? I get misgendered a lot mm-hmm. at work and generally. Um, you'd be surprised how often it happens even when you're, like, doled up. Yeah. It's weird. Um, I kind of just brush it off. I probably should speak up more, mm-hmm. but I'm not that sort of confident a person, so a lot of the time I just brush it off. Like, I don't know, these people are strangers. They don't actually... They're not actually, like, no one's actually looking at me and going, yeah, I'm going to misgender this person. Yeah. Like, like you'd have to be a real kind of dick to do that. Yeah, yeah. So most of the time I just brush it off. Like, I'm never mm-hmm. going to see this person again. It is what it is. Like, I know who I am. I'm confident in myself. Like, I don't worry about it. For the, the people listening, what is misgendering? Can you describe that? So I'm a she, her. Those are my pronouns. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you refer to me, please use she and her yeah misgendering me would be to call me he or him Mm -hmm. i don't like that no (laughs) um i don't think anyone would so yeah Mm -hmm. it's it's changing it's definitely getting better especially Mm -hmm. in uh the workplace like like there was a real like real effort at my workplace to push the pronouns and everyone lets you know their pronouns everyone's super respectful of it so it's changing it's just it's a long process. Like it's take, it takes time. Yeah, for sure. I, I guess then like in your last kind of year um, and last, I, I guess, little bit, like being able to be yourself, what is the main difference between like just feeling like you are who you're supposed to be and the way that you kind of were throughout, you know, your later high school, early uni days? Like what is the main difference between the way that you are, I guess. I just feel like I can be open with everyone Yeah. now. Like I'm just not hiding anything. I don't have anything I need to be worried about in the back of my head about who I am and how I look and all these different things. Like it's just so much, it's just freedom. Like yeah. it's just in my head, it's just freedom to just be myself and not constantly have to question, you know, whether or not I want to do something or look a certain way or be a, be a certain person, it's, it is just the biggest weight off ever. And then there's the other, there's the other side of it with, um, gender euphoria Mm -hmm. where thankfully I don't suffer too much from dysphoria, Mm -hmm. uh, which I'm very grateful for. But can you describe what gender dysphoria is? Yeah, I'll do my best. (laughs) Um, it's, it's different for everyone, I think, mm-hmm. but it's if you have, uh, and I think everyone gets it too. Like, I was this isn't about to just say. a transgender thing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like a part of you, whether it's physical or emotional or anything that doesn't align with your gender in the case of gender dysphoria, but just you as a person. So, you know. A stereotypical examples would be a trans woman gets gender dysphoria because of her Adam's apple yeah. or because of her, you know, yeah. downstairs area yeah. or hairline or things like that. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's dysphoria and it can be seriously, seriously bad for people, like yeah. really, really harmful mentally mm-hmm. for a lot of people. Um, and so medical transitioning is is sort of the best way to address those physical things yep. where you can change a lot of things about your body to align with how you feel. And your gender. Yeah, yep. and mm-hmm. that's kind of the approach to helping gender dysphoria. And so on the other side of that, um, gender euphoria, How does what? what is that? Yeah, again, this is something I talk about with my roommate a lot. So yeah. this is still something that everyone has and mm-hmm. everyone feels. It's just, it's like... I don't know, like if you dress up for an event or something and you look really good and you're like, yeah, girl, you're rocking it. Yes, like slay. you feel <laughs> you feel really good, right? Yeah. Like you feel great. Like it's similar to that. Yeah. So it's different in terms of where what my transition was because you go from, you know, dressing like a boy and looking like a boy, like that's on one end of the spectrum. Mm-hmm. And then you go the full way to uh, wearing a dress and I'm dolled up and I look cute. It's just that like... 
it's so affirming and it's mm-hmm. so exciting to be able to finally express yourself like that. It's just an overwhelming joy. Yeah. Like, oh, I love this. Yeah. I love how I look. And there's so many different things that go into it that just give you that sense of fulfillment and yeah. love of, you know, feminine things if that's what that's what makes you euphoric or masculine things if that's what makes you euphoric. But yeah. I think it's something everyone experiences. Absolutely. And, I mean, I can give an example so um, people can understand, like, on you know i i have experienced this in things like so the WNBL awards i wore a dress i'm so uncomfortable in dresses like so uncomfortable and i have a lot of people in my life they're like oh you look so cute in dresses sometimes i look at myself in the mirror in a dress and i'm like this feels wrong yeah, like yeah. i just and i like i might see how my shoulders look or uh or something i'll pick apart something that makes me feel slightly gender dysphoric um but then on the same end of that sometimes I feel like so like in a suit I'm like yes this is it yeah. this is how I'm supposed to be but I yeah. still feel intensely feminine yeah. but it's something about the way that I don't feel dysphoric about my body and that's that's an example of that um on someone that isn't transgender to show that like people experience that and they just don't know what to call it there's, there's just a way to express yourself yeah. that, that, and if you express yourself accurately and how you want it's great and you feel good and it's exciting and regardless of like gender obscures that because we feel we should be a certain way depending on where we where we fit in yeah so without that I think everyone would just express themselves how they want and feel great about it yeah Um, so yeah it's it's interesting how gender kind of prescribes dysphoria with a lot of people and the different the different kind of it's like a box. Yeah. yeah. It's it's interesting. It's interesting. And it's hard too because you've got, you know, without without feeling not great as a boy, I mean, I love engaging with being feminine and yeah. that's what I feel good doing. Mm-hmm. But there isn't there is no such thing as that without the other. Yeah. So it's it's a complex, it's really complex. Absolutely. Right? Do you um I, I I ask about like the education process for everyone right like not just like people in schools but like for people that want to like learn about what a transitioning is being transgender where are the resources there Uh, and do you have any suggestions (laughs) speak with if you know people ask if they're comfortable talking about it and speak with them yeah the big thing i would say to anyone who's interested in learning about transitioning is that it's not it's not a one size fits all. Yeah. Everyone's transition is very, very different. Mm-hmm. In terms of resources, you can just go and search up and look up. I yeah. found there's one called Trans Hub. Yeah. This New South Wales government thing. That's fantastic. That's what I looked at when I was looking at these things. Or just talk to you, talk to a gender gender health clinic. Mm-hmm. They're happy to hook you up with those resources. That's what they do. So yeah, I would I would definitely go and look. There's stuff out there, but the big one is you know. It, it's hard to teach people about something that's so subjective. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's such an individual experience for everyone, right? Yeah, like yeah. I think that there's this misconception out there that transgender people all fit into a box, right? Like yeah. everyone's transition is the same and it's so completely not the case. No way. No way. No, mine would be super different to other people's, mm-hmm. super different to other people's. And there'd be a lot of people who were comfortable when they were younger and made that choice that I didn't and transitioned and their transition would be totally different or people who are older and they have no idea why what the feelings even are yeah. and then it's the process of figuring that out and then coming to terms with that themselves like it's just it's, it's so different everyone has a different brain yeah so everyone goes about it in a very very different way different experience yeah your day-to-day now and support systems I talk a lot about support support systems and how important it is for us just as people to have people around us that we can trust. And do you have a really great support system just in your general life now, day to day, that just understand you for who you are? Yeah, it's, yeah, it's super strong. It's not huge. It's my family and friends I've had forever. Mm -hmm. But we're all so tight. We're all so tight in it. I could go to them with anything and they'd be great. And even coming into basketball, there's a lot of people who have given me so much and done so much for me in this space that 
that I have a lot of support yeah. from a lot of people and that's been amazing. What, this is the question that like the one that has been asked over and over and over and over. Why did you decide to come back to basketball? Uh, because I love it. Mm -hmm. Because I love it. I always, in playing the sport, just the actual sport, playing it, basketball was always my first love mm -hmm. and I'll always love it. Mm -hmm. And when I transitioned, I kind of, it went through my head. I was like, if you do this, then you're not going to be playing sport. Mm -hmm. Um, and that was tough, but that was the decision that I made in my head. And it was only through, like, I, I still shoot around all the time Yeah. during that time. Like, I still just go and work out and shoot around and all that sort of stuff because I love doing it. Yeah. And it was only through a work event someone was watching me play and they were like, hey, do you play for someone? Would you be interested in playing for someone? And the penny just sort of dropped again where I was like, yeah, actually, I would. If that's an option, I'd love to. Yeah. Like, that'd be great. And then things just sort of progressed into what they are now where – Every time I'm on the basketball court, every time I'm with the girls, every time I've got anything going on that's to do with playing basketball, it's just a, it's just a gift. Like yeah. I never thought I'd be here. I never thought I'd be playing basketball again. I never thought I'd be playing basketball at this level again. Yeah. And it's super exciting, super grateful. So stepping into that Killsyth team, what was it like? Was that scary for you to then make that step or did it feel natural and um, how, how was the team? And like just tell me about that like – how that was for you because making that decision in itself would have been scary but then how was like you know your first practice you I know I went like to a session mm -hmm. and was so nervous yeah like super nervous mm -hmm. um because I didn't know what to expect from the club or the girls or anyone so I was pretty scared and I was pretty bad as well <laughs> like had a shocking session couldn't run out the training session because yeah. I was just not fit enough. Yeah. Um, and then they broke for the year. So I went to one session, sort of felt like I embarrassed myself a bit and then was like, okay, I, I had been invited to come back and do some more sessions if I wanted to. Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay, well, if I'm going to do that, I should probably not take a break. <laughs> and then I just spent, did spend all my own time. Mm -hmm getting fitter and getting some touch and mm -hmm. then came back the year or this year mm -hmm. and sort of did a like we did a couple of sessions some of the girls would just come in and we'd play three on three or something or like really chill stuff and that was really great to sort of dip my feet back in and get back into it um and then once training sessions started up again it mm -hmm. was seamless like felt like part of, felt confident in my playing ability felt confident in being a part of the team all of the girls have been so welcoming, mm -hmm. so lovely, so much better than I ever thought anyone could be in this space. Mm -hmm. I can't give them enough credit with how they've gone about this situation. Um, and the same with all the coaching and yeah. even the club. They've all been so welcoming. They all ask me the right questions. They all are really sensitive to what, you know, could be an issue for me and yeah. how, to, how to go about it and how to address these different things. But it's been amazing. Yeah. Yeah. You're just like the the crazy thing is, is I, I remember when we connected just the other day, I was like, Lexi's like, just a girl that wants to play basketball. Like <laughs> she's just one of the girls that wants to play basketball. Yeah. And it's it's a uh, I believe that basketball is a really special thing to so many people. And like hearing you talk about it, I'm like, it's just a something that you enjoy doing. And I think that, you know, it's it's special that you were able to hold on to that throughout your transition and, and your life, like to be able to have sport is like as, and not fully identify with it either, but like have it as a part of us, it's super special and yeah. we, we can't underplay that. And I guess um, like moving forward, not just in basketball, but in, in your life, the life of Lexi, your next, like do you have goals that you're looking forward to in, you know, your outside life? Um, like, you know, I ask people these questions and sometimes it's like, buy a house, start a studio, you know, like, do you have like these overarching goals? Are you a goal setter or are you just like, you know what, I'm taking it one day at a time? I used to, mm -hmm. and I used to run myself in circles a bit with focusing on what I wanted to do and how I was going to get there. And so I try not to now because yeah. I just focus on it too much. Yeah. 
I really want to, one, I want to play good basketball. Mm-hmm. Uh, I want to have a, a good basketball career. Yeah. Um, I'm committed to, to playing basketball mm-hmm. and I want to make it my career. Yeah. And that's sort of the most I've committed to for the next however long that yep. may be. Outside of that, yeah, day by day, we'll see how it goes. These conversations of getting people to listen to like your journey, to hear just who you are, like who is Lexi, to putting a face to this idea that everyone's come up with. Yeah. That's the that's the most important thing right now because, you know, there's so much circulating about like who you are and like who how you're going to present and what you're supposed to be and blah, like and it's a it's su- suffocating and b it's just wrong like yeah let's put a face to your name and who you are because you're a wonderful human that just wants to exist and that's that's the baseline like yeah i think it's been yeah i think it's good to have a bit of a voice yeah. now because when it's this hypothetical person and people are making a picture of what a transgender athlete looks like in their head. Um, yeah. One, I don't think it's me, but two, I think it's a bit harsh. And yeah. people just forget that there's actually a person. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that there's actually like, and, and online it's so easy to be able to just like say whatever you're saying and not think about the consequences about that. But I guess so we can kind of take a, a last little deep dive into your you. I want to ask you about something that, is there anything that people don't know about you and wouldn't expect, like something completely random? <laughs> That's really hard. I know, it's a really hard question. <laughs> um, I really love disco music. That is the best. That is the best answer. <laughs> yeah. That's so it's random. Not that interesting. But... I know, I didn't know anyone that likes disco music. Oh, so there, there you go. go. There you You're go. my first disco music liker. Yeah. <laughs> Obsessed. I love that for you. Now um, I'm just picturing you now with like a nine a sixties yeah. outfit on, just like oh. you know, dun, 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 yeah. Dun, 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 yeah. That's if there's places saying. like that, that's where I'd be. I'm sure there is. Brunswick Street and Smith Street, surely there's a disco vibe along there somewhere. somewhere. It does exist. If I've got headphones in, that's... That's what you're listening I, to? It, the that, Bee Gees? That's what I work out. That's workout music. <laughs> disco music is your workout <laughs> yeah, music? Yeah, yeah. That's actually the best. Um, okay, so then you now sitting here on a podcast with me talking about who you are, what would you say to your younger self if that if you got the opportunity to sit down and look at your younger self and be like, hey, this is what's going to happen to you, what would you say? What would your advice be and what would you warn them of? Buckle up, kiddo. (laughs) It's going to be a bit of a journey. Yeah. Um, It's hard because part of me is like, yeah, I would tell them to just love themselves and let themselves be who they are. But at the same time, I wouldn't change anything that, yeah. that I've done over the last 12, 13 years. You do it exactly the same all over again? <sighs> probably not. Yeah. Probably not. I'd probably, I'd probably <laughs> change some things. Up, yeah, yeah. Be there for them and be like, it's, it's all right to have these feelings. That's all good. Yeah. And is that something you would then um, – say to I guess you know some young 13 year old that's sitting there and listening like having these feelings like hey it's going to be okay yeah it is going to be okay there are people out there 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 is resources out there there's people who support you always and then what would you say to people that just purely don't understand and they're like, oh, I just don't get it. What's your response to that? Um, I think if if you don't get it and you don't know, one, don't yell stuff on the internet about yeah. it mm-hmm. um, because it's probably wrong. Yeah. It's, two, if you go and learn about it, Yeah. go and ask people about it, go and look online, go and talk to people about it. Yeah. Because... Even people, it was even people who would consider themselves educated. I think a lot of the time, yeah, 
there's a lot to be educated on. Yeah, for sure. And I, I've had these conversations recently where people don't understand and they're scared to not understand. And it's like, that's okay too. If you don't understand, just ask the questions. Yeah. But ask them nicely. Yeah. Be nice people. Talk to people the way you would like to be spoken to. And I think that especially in this space, and not just about you, Lex, but about anything that people don't understand. When you ask, because it's okay to ask, be nice, be understanding, be empathetic. And there's nothing wrong with asking the question, but there is something wrong with being rude while you do it. There is something wrong with misgendering people. There is something wrong with not, um, not being able to put aside something that makes you uncomfortable to ask a question. I think that there, there needs to be space for people to be okay being uncomfortable and then trying to understand everyone. Because isn't that just like, that's life, right? Like we're yeah. not, we, we don't walk around looking at everyone in the street like, I don't understand you or you or you. Like it, it, we should just be open and try to understand. And I think that, I think that, for people that don't understand, my message would be ask the questions, educate yourself, and when you ask, just be nice. Yeah. Be yeah. a nice, respectful person. And then you can't actually go wrong if you conduct yourself with respect. Yeah. And I guess for for me and and for you and for for everyone else listening, what would be something that people just don't understand about your situation if you're willing to share anything? Um, a lot. Yeah. <laughs> a lot, most of it, because I, I'm very sensitive to the fact that it's a novel situation. Yeah. It's a complex one um, and it's going to take time to explain things to people and educate people and for people to understand where I come from, who I am, all of these different things. Um I just think they need to take the time to listen mm -hmm. and not let their not let their biases or not let their sort of opinions get in the way of of listening to what I'm saying. I think. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. I love that answer. I really love that answer. Um, I guess the there's a last couple of questions here. I'm just kind of kind of roll through them, but I know okay. that I'm going to be on a tangent. I do this often. Yeah. Um, how do you think people see you versus who you actually are? And I want that to be answered in two parts, right? Okay. Younger you, I want you to answer that first, <laughs> and you now. The younger me, distraction in class. As I got older, probably dickhead. <laughs> yeah. Very silly, yeah. very loud stupid mm -hmm. idiot mm -hmm. but still sensitive mm -hmm. a lot of fun and now i don't know classy hopefully <laughs> classy, classy. <laughs> yeah um still fun still silly still the same person it's just a different wrapping i love that yeah i love that and so the online community Right, and the, the support, let's talk about support here. How can people support not, not just you, but inclusivity in general online when there is so much space for people to just be hateful? That's a big one. Yeah. Because <laughs> uh, if you know, I'd like to know because I'm still yeah, trying to figure that one hard. out. <laughs> I, think, I think focusing on building the right narrative and promoting what's positive about this space and what's great about inclusion and just helping each other, helping each other have a voice for what's right mm -hmm. rather than screaming at a dog, chasing its tail with what's wrong. Yeah. Um, I think a lot of the time engaging in debate that isn't actually based in fact is, can be harmful or can just be a waste of time. Mm -hmm. So I think, Focusing on focusing on trying to build up all the positives about inclusion and about diversity and about what makes those things so great because without those things, we wouldn't be where we are today and they're only going to make us better. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. 
Do you have any um, idols or people that you look up to? I don't know. <laughs> I used to. I would have used to back in the day, probably basketballers. Yeah. But nowadays, I don't know. It's coming into coming into women's basketball has been pretty cool because yeah. unfortunately I didn't know many of you yeah. before I was playing a lot of basketball. Yeah. But, but now watching – Watching you play and watching people like Kayla, Kayla play, mm-hmm. Mon Conti, everyone playing in the final tonight, yeah. go watch. Yeah. Um, it's really impressive and it's really cool and it's a great game and you're all incredible athletes. So all of you are sort of my idols. That's where I want to get to. <laughs> That's where I want to be. So Yeah. Yeah. That's, I love that answer. You just made me blush. Mm. It's not the blush I put on this morning. <laughs> Um, so then I guess as, as someone who is just trying to live their life every day, do you still have things that you struggle with, um, that, that you would like to talk about that maybe other people might be going through too? Like for me, when I talk about stuff, I'm my main shtick is mental health stuff. Do you struggle with anything like that day to day? Um, and, and what, what does that look like for you when you're trying to just kind of exist? <laughs> yeah. So I think, I think I would share a lot of struggles with, uh, a lot of transgender people for sure. Mm-hmm. That's pretty obvious. Um, and those things, those things come down to, you know, sort of superficial, you know, oh, I wish my voice was different or I wish my body was different, these kinds of things. Mm-hmm. But on an everyday basis, I would say the biggest thing, biggest challenge I face would probably be my anxiety. Mm -hmm. I get super anxious and I just go loop in my head about the worst possible thing that can happen out of something. Mm -hmm. And so trying to break myself out of that and trying to be in the moment and not get ahead of myself and worry about what's going to happen, that's probably the biggest thing I have trouble with most days. How does that relate to a sporting environment for you? So do you still feel anxiety and anxiousness when you're playing basketball or thinking about basketball or is that um, kind of your escape place? I think when I'm actually playing and when I'm on the court, it's an escape mm-hmm. for sure because it's intense. It's in the most it's visceral. Like yeah. you don't have a choice but to be in the moment yeah. and be doing what what you're doing yeah and I love that that's what I really love about it in the lead up to in the lead up to stuff I'll I'll freak out yeah same yeah Yeah, totally Uh, yep (laughs) yeah warm-ups I might look cool calm collected yeah but in my head I'm like the drive to the game yeah (laughs) yeah Yeah. big time big time and then after the game I'm probably all right yeah 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 it's over what was I worrying about yeah that's fair that's totally fair. Um, and then, like, I kind of I kind of asked you before what you would say to your younger self, right? But do you think little you would be proud of you? I don't know what little B would make of me. <laughs> I reckon they'd be pretty excited. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think they would be. Yeah? Definitely. Just, like, taking a – what is it when you look through the spyglass and you're like, wow, you know? <laughs> yeah. I reckon they'd be a bit, like – that's a joke. Not really, though. Yeah. yeah. Who is joking? Yeah. But no. I think that um, there's, you know, you know, in the law of attraction, if I'm allowed to get through through here for a little bit, um, when you put out to the universe what, you know, what you want your life to be and what you want to create, and I think that the the concept of, you know, we can control certain things, and I think that. Being able to live as your yourself is like the number one of the number one things I would believe that would contribute to someone's happiness because waking up in every, every day not feeling like you are who you are and that's not an experience specific to transgender people either. That's an experience that I mean I felt I know a lot of other people feel where you wake up and you're like I have no idea what I'm doing, who am I, what's happening, you know. And I think that being able to be yourself 100 percent 
honestly, openly and not feel like you're hiding parts of yourself because we all do that. Mm. We all hide parts of ourselves. We all hide parts that we believe wouldn't be accepted by quote unquote society. We all hide parts of ourselves that we, we feel that for whatever reason, there's a certain attachment of shame. And I think that working through shame and trying to figure out where that comes from is difficult. It is so difficult, but necessary in order to kind of blossom, right? It's like kind of, um, I'm going to butcher this. Um, the, there's that flower that's really pretty that sits on the top of the water and then all of its roots go down into like the mud and the murky. Is it a water lily? Am I lotus flower or something like that? Um, I got a nod over there. So I'm going to say it's a lotus flower. Um, and so that when they sit on the top of the water, like they're able to be because of all the crap that's underneath. And I think that, you know, being able to openly talk about our experiences is the so important because you have no idea how many people go through all of this. Yeah. I, it, again, ask the questions. You'd be amazed how similar a lot of, I can only speak for myself, but you'd yeah. be amazed how similar the experience is for a lot of people in a lot of ways. And to, to, to finish up, I kind of want to ask you, what is something that you would ask of people in the next couple of weeks moving forward as you, you're just trying to figure out how to exist in this space? And what, what are you asking of people to, you know, like for me, I would say I'm asking people to be nice and to, and to treat me and you and everyone else with respect. What are you asking of people over the next couple of weeks? Yeah, please be nice. Please be nice. It's been a hard week. So just try to remember that there's actual people that are affected by these discussions and these debates. Um, yeah, that's probably it. Simple, but. Simple, but should be simple, right? Should be yeah. simple. And again, I really do encourage people to just respect nice and also like listen to Lexi's story because she you're a cool person. You've had a cool life. Um, I, you're a quirky, fun human. You are kind and you're actually quite brilliant. Like the way that you're able to articulate your experience is um, quite niche. A lot of people can't actually talk about their feelings in that way and talk about their experiences. And I'm very grateful that you've come on and been able to share. And I truly believe this is just a part of your story. Like there's so much that we haven't heard about. You know, there's so much more that's happened and that is going on and that will go on. But to be able to share your story with us on here is so important, not just for you to, you know, be able to have some sort of autonomy over the, the narrative that's been put out there, but for everyone listening hear what she has to say and and put a face to the name and everyone meet Lexi Rogers. <laughs> this is Lexi. This is who you've been hearing about. She is a beautiful, beautiful, wonderful person and she will continue to grow and blossom and be who she is. And if you run into her at a basketball stadium, give her a smile, maybe a hug. I don't know. You know, Be nice to Lexi and, and you know, encourage these conversations within your circles have the conversations with your parents have the conversations with your sisters and brothers and peer groups and um let's help make basketball to be a space of inclusivity and of love and basketball should be a place of inclusivity and love for everyone that walks into a stadium and that's how it should be and that's what we are working towards it being. Um, but Lexi, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Um, I, I, I really can't wait to even get you on next year so we can talk about this last year and yeah. everything that's happening. And I'm so excited to watch you grow and blossom and in whichever direction you choose to go. And um, thank you again. Um, I really appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you so much. I'm feeling very gassed up after that. Like, like feeling myself. <laughs> Gas me up, son. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. So thank you so much. And to all the listeners out there, can't wait for you to hear this. Um, this is Annalie Maley with Lexi Rogers, and that was Under the Surface.